My topic today is called the reason for the season. That's why I said pun intended earlier when I refer to the season that we are in, because we are in a season. You know, in case you don't know it, this is what's called in all around the at least Western world, <laughs> Christmas time. I know some of them try to change it now and call it Xmas and put other names in front of it, but it's always been Christmas. And we celebrate as Christmas as we celebrate the birth of Christ. And there are different themes that come out, and one of them talks about the reason for the season. And in most cases, the reason for the season is always referred to as the reason for the season being for the birth of Jesus. So Jesus would be the reason for the season. But I come today, you know, to bring you a little something new, a little something different, but accurate, scripturally accurate with respect to the reason for the season that we are in. We know, yes, that this originates from pagan worship and pagan ideas. This is not our problem. We know why we celebrate the season. Today, I want to be more specific for this reason for the season. As I say more specific, I also gonna be more precise. I believe that precision is vitally important when we are rightly dividing the word of God. So what's the reason for the season? And then I'm got highlighted right love. Emphasis is on the word right. Love is there, but right love. Because I'm going to talk about a whole lot of different types of love. But what is important is that we have the right love. I remember, it continues to stand out in my mind because I remember being a little irritated about it when I saw it again. It was a news clipping of the former President Obama. And he was at the White House having a press conference with the Dan president of Kenya. And he was sort of throwing a little dig at him with respect to their stance on the LGBTQ and the homosexual agenda in their country. And one of the things he said to him was that he used L-O-V-E and said that he cannot see how anybody will try to keep somebody away that loves somebody else. And the whole emphasis is on the fact that if this person loves this person, then we should just respect what they're doing and let them be able to love whoever they want to love. And we shouldn't try to keep that love apart from each other. But I said my title is called The Reason for the Season, Right Love. And that's what we're going to emphasize on, this right love. And why this reason for the season? Praise the Lord. I have a couple uh, key verses that I want to go to first. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Here we get into the reading of God's holy word. It's a very simple one. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Praise the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Adam never got deceived. 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 says, For as in Adam, for because of Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The opportunity for all is there to be made alive. Praise the Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I have two points as per normal to use to bring forward this message. Point one says, when your love gets it wrong, the course. This is the course. This is setting up the whole reason for the season. Point two says, what only the right love can do, the cure. There's a course and a cure we want to look at today and see how this relates to the reason for the season and what right love is all about. Praise the Lord. Let's go to point number one. Point one, when your love gets it wrong, 
it almost sounds like a contradiction, especially if you're going to listen to a President Obama, because the emphasis on the left and on this woke society is that as long as you love, <laughs> as long as you're in love, as long as you're doing something out of love, it cannot be wrong. Is this possible? Is this reality? Let's look at Genesis chapter 12. We're going to see what love does, what love can cause you to do. Genesis 12, uh, verses 10 to 13, it says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I knew that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee a lot. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Mercy, mercy. <laughs> this is a serious situation to find yourself in when you love your wife so much and you happen to be blessed to be married to such a beautiful woman that you know <laughs> that the custom in their days was, whoa, if they saw, especially those that would be in authority, if they saw a beautiful woman that they liked, okay. It doesn't matter that she's married. I'm just going to kill the husband, and then she's going to be a free woman. <laughs> That's what they would do. So Abraham knows that he's got a beautiful wife. He loves her so much, he solicits her in his lie. He solicits her to lie for him. If you know the true account of them, you'll know that they are sort of sister and brothers, if you know the full story. They are sort of sisters and brothers. They got the same daddy. They got different mamas, but in back of them days, they had the same daddy. So technically, she was his sister. But we know that Abraham is practicing deceit, lack of faith, motivated by a genuine love. He gets his wife to lie for him. Look at Genesis chapter 16. This is real love, though. Abraham really loves her. Genesis 16, verses 1 and 2 and 4. And Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had and had made an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. You can have real love, saints. You can have this real love, and you can have good intentions. Yet your love will be wrong if it causes you to disobey God. I'm going to emphasize on having the right love, not just love in and of itself. Abram loved his wife. It was a genuine love. Sarai loved her husband. They had a promise from God that they, those two, would have a child. They loved each other so much that Sarai is willing to let her servant have a child with her husband. But what is being demonstrated her saints? What is standing out her? What is standing out is my will. What is standing out is my way. My genuine love is causing me to compromise what I know God would have me to do. This is what I want us to understand, that just because you've got the right intention, just because you've got some real love going on, it doesn't open the door up for you to be disobedient to God. Because your love has to be subject to what God's will is. If not, you'll compromise what God is calling you to do. You'll compromise 
what he would have you to do. You'll compromise what his standards are. Look at Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25. Once again, this love, real love. It says, I ran her days to be delivered were fulfilled. This is Rebecca. Behold, there were twins in her womb. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venture. But Rebekah loved Jacob. This is some real love here. Two parents, twins are born, and somehow is the apple of his father's eye, and he loves him more than he loves Jacob, and Rebekah loves Jacob more than she loves Esau. But it's real love. It's real parental love. Look at Genesis chapter 27 now. And verses 5 to 8 and then 11 to 13. We're going to continue to talk about Jacob, Rebekah, Esau, and Isaac. Verse 5 says, And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venture and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venture and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Rebecca is telling her son to obey my voice according to that which I command thee, because I love you. So we go to verse 11, and it says, And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, Peer Evangel, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, because that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> that is exactly what I am doing. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing, because Isaac wants to bless his eldest son. Rebekah wants Jacob to take that part, because those are twins. Esau came out first. So Esau is still the one to get the first blessing. And so she's trying to make a way for Jacob to get that blessing. And Jacob said, listen, that of course me to get a curse as opposed to a blessing. Verse 13 says, and his mother said unto him, upon me be the curse, my son. Only obey my voice, mercy, and go fetch me them. This is some genuine love, saints, of a mother that's looking out for her son. She's got two of them, but she loves this one more. And in that genuine love, she's put together this plan to look out for him, for his heritage, for his inheritance. She's willing to say, listen, let any curse that's out there come on me. I want us to know, saints, this is what happens sometimes when we get love wrong. Just because we got the real love in, it doesn't mean that we're on the right path. When your love for someone or something replaces your love for God, you will even be willing to sin. Abraham slipped into it. Rebecca, the mother of two sons, is willing to take a curse on her life just so that she can fulfill the love in our heart for her son. And we're going to talk about love, saints. We're going to talk about the right type of love because we're going to see how this ties in to the reason for the season. And it's going to surprise you what the real reason for the season is. What is the real reason for the season, saints? Look at Genesis chapter 3. And that was our main text today. It's a well-known text in we always want to come away from this text whenever we read it with something new from it, something that inspires us and, and something that opens God's word up to us. The scripture goes on to say, now the serpent was more subtle. That is not an insult. That is a compliment because this that beast was so smart, so sharp. It was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. And then she shows her little 
<laughs> paraphrasing her because God never said this. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God never said that. You won't find that in scripture. But I think this is Eve putting her own little uh, miser in there. Verse 4 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. You're not really going to die. For God, though know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and she did eat it, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed feed leaves together and made themselves aprons. This, we know, is the beginning of the first sin on earth. There was another sin that started in heaven, but this one is what brings separation for mankind. First Timothy chapter 2 and 14 starts to give you more clarity on the sin. It says that Adam was not deceived. In this moment of stuff I just read to you, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was the one that was actually in the original transgression. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It goes on to say, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, this being Adam. This is the one man that caused sin to enter into the world. And death by this sin, spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. And so death passed upon all men now, for that all have sinned. From that point on, you are sin nature. You are born into sin, and you will always sin. All because of what this one guy done. Not if. All because of what Adam done. And this is an important thing for man to understand the responsibility that's on them. And why Satan targets man to not to be in leadership. God will use women because he will not be held back by disobedient man. But God has an order for man to lead. And there's too many men today that are comfortable Letting women lead. Women are more than capable of leading. But what you're missing is the order that God has put in place. And because of that, you men are bringing this type of problems on yourself. You men are not in order where God would have you to be. The women will get their blessings from God. They will send their treasures in heaven as they step up and are used of God. And we men that are not standing up are going to miss our blessings. Praise the Lord. Adam had not had some real beautiful, I can't emphasize this enough, saints, so that we understand this picture of what's going on her. Adam had some real beautiful love. He loved Eve so much, Pastor Stephen. I know you know I'm good. He chose to die for and with her, it was a wrong love. His love for her is caused this season that we're in. Yes, we say Jesus is the reason for the season, but the real reason for the season is our sinful state. That's the real reason for the season that we're in. Yes, Jesus becomes it because he's come to fix the reason for the season. And it started with a wrong love. Adam knew what God had told him to do. Adam knew when he finds his wife, bringing him this fruit, whatever it is, he looking at a dead woman. He looking at a dead wife. He realized that she has disobeyed God. Scripture goes on to say, I just read in 2 Timothy 2 and 14, Adam wasn't deceived. Adam wasn't blind to what she had done. But Adam knew that he was made in God's image. Adam knew that she came out of him. 
He birthed her. So he wants to save her. It's speculative on my part, but I truly believe that Adam said to himself, well, God won't kill both of us if I do it. <laughs> I'm made in God's image. God was spirit. This is my speculative state. Because nothing else other than the fact that, yes, there is some real genuine love that Adam has for you. You know, let's be honest, saints. You know, how many men, when they realize that their women have put themselves in a state where they've got to be killed, I'm going to say, okay, listen, I'm going to pray for you. Um, um, but, you know, I'll see you in the bar bar, like, you know, bizarre here. I'm not dying with you. I'm most not dying for you. Most men are going to take this and say, well, listen, you know what the deal was. You know God said not to touch it. Okay, so, you know, there's no sense both of us dying. You know what I mean? I'm going to pray for you. Adam loves her so much that he is willing to die for her. It's some fantastic love, saints. That is some unbelievable love. It's a type of love, actually. It becomes a type of love, you know? It becomes a type of love because this is the same state the second Adam ends up doing. The second Adam comes and says, well, okay, the only way to save the world is for me to die for them. This is what the second Adam does. He follows what Adam does, but he does it with the right love. Adam disobeys God with his wrong love and becomes the reason for this season. This season that's called Christmas. This season that talks about God sending Jesus to be born. The reason that Jesus has to be sent is because Adam's love was wrong. He loved Eve more than he loved obeying God. And I'm saying to you today, saying that there is a God in heaven that loves us so much that we have this season today. We have this season to bring us back into a right place with God. It also highlights the fact that we need to understand that love in and of itself does not justify anything that you're doing. If anything that you're doing is coming before God, if anything that this love you have causes you to compromise God, your spouse, your boyfriend, nothing you're doing can get in the way of your relationship with God. If God ain't first in your life, no matter what love you're displaying to whomever, it's a wrong love. It's a Egypt love that Abraham showed when he was scared and he lied about his wife. It's a Rebecca love that makes you do deception and be willing to take a curse on yourself. It's a Adam love that is willing to die for his wife as opposed to just standing his ground and being obedient to God. I bring this up, saints, because we are but flesh and there are many things in our life and Satan knows it that are going to challenge you in your walk with God. You can say you're serious. You can say you love God, but be assured. I think pastor even mentioned it today that if you're doing stuff for God, if you're really being effective for God, Satan's on your track. If it's not on your track, that means you ain't no bother to him. We need to be focused, saints, because we will be challenged in our walk. If we make that claim that we are Christians, that we love God, make sure the other stuff that we love is not going to cause us to compromise. Let's look at point number two. Point number two begins to really show you what right love looks like. What only right love can do, the cure. We heard just now about what this wrong love done. The wrong love is the cause for the season. The wrong love is the cause. Adam loves Eve so much that he compromises. Adam's wrong love is what causes all men 
to be sinners from that point on. It was a genuine love. Don't get it wrong. There are many people with some genuine love. Rather the homosexuals. Rather the lesbians. Rather the pedophiles. They love stuff that scripture says is wrong. I'm not judging them. Scripture says it's wrong. Adam's response to his wife being disobedient to God is to love her more than he loves God. His wife is in deception. Instead of covering her, he walks into it. And thus, saints, this is the reason for the season that we're in. Yes, ultimately, it's about Jesus. But Jesus is forced to come because of what Adam done. Because of Adam's wrong love way back then. Let's look at Deuteronomy 5. Because we want to understand things. And we want to also be challenged today about our right love. About the right love, one, first of all, that comes from God. But us having the right love towards God. It says, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, these false gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and sharing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Listen, it's being said right here, simply way back then, your love for God causes him to show favor on you for generations. Your obedience to what he's calling you to do is the ultimate demonstration of your love to God. We can say whatever we like. God judges us based on our obedience to what the word of God is commanding in our lives. And I want us to know that every day, God finds a way to ask you, do you really love me? Do you really trust me? He'll ask you that in some way. How important is your relationship with me as opposed to whatever else is going on in your life that you might think is important? This is the personal challenge we all face. Genesis chapter 22, well-known text. Genesis chapter 22, God talking with Abraham. And this is where this word love first appears in the Bible. This is a type. This whole scenario that we know of Abraham being asked to give up his son, to sacrifice his son to God. It says, and he said, God speaking to Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. First time his word shows up. And get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him, therefore, a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And cleared the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lead, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Those words there are unbelievably <laughs> massive when you talk about your relationship with God. Now I know that you really love me. Saints, yes, it's scary. It is very, very scary. God wants your love for him. The right love that will cause you to be obedient to him no matter what. And that's why I say that it gets scary because it's a challenge sometimes. In this scenario here, Abraham is acting out what God is going to do in that very same place 2,000 years later and give up his only begotten son. But the angel says something 
that each of us has to ask ourselves. The angel says, now I know that you really love God because you ain't held back this from God. Adam held back his love for God because of his love he had for his wife. The question to each of us today, is it anything that won't hold him back? Look what I'll do, whatever you say, whatever, as long as you're in this. Lord, I'll do whatever, whatever you want me to do, God. I'll go wherever, wherever, as long as it ain't too much of my time, too much of my talent, too much of my treasury. What in your life can that angel say that I know that you love God so much because you ain't held back? He gave up his only begotten son. As a hundred and something year old man, his only real son, he was willing to trust God that if God, that's why it's called what is called, that month is called what is called, in the month it will be seen, in the month it will be provided, because God is able to provide in Abraham's mind. It's not his problem. God made the promise that Isaac, in Isaac, Will be all these blessings, will be all these generations. When we take God at His word, we don't let our love for whether it's our children, whether it's our time, whether it's our possessions, to get in the way of our obedience to God. This is the reason for the season. Because Adam compromised way back then. We have separation from God. He was motivated by a real love for his wife. But I'm telling you today, saints, it's still the same. Every day, Satan will give you a reason not to put God first in your life. Every day, that's the challenge we face when we claim to be children of God. Abraham said, not my child. I'm not making the mistake that I made in Egypt and lying and being disobedient to God. I'm going to trust God. Abraham learns and understands that he must love God first. And if I love God first, it becomes God's problem when I'm faced with something that looks like it's going to hurt me. All that means is that, okay, God is going to have to resurrect Isaac. That's what was Abraham's mindset when he picks up a knife and gets ready. And the angel said, whoa, 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 whoa. Now I know it's nothing you won't hold back. Now I know you're not the same guy that was in Egypt. Saints, we face this today. We face our Egypt experiences. We face our Isaac and Jacob scenarios that may come in our lives. Ultimately, we may face our Isaac experience on the month. It's an individual thing, saints. God knows what your problem is. God knows what you hang on. He told the rich guy, listen, give up that money. Because that's what's holding you back. He told the woman at the well something different. What was holding her back? I say to you today, saints, we need to make sure that we're experiencing that right love for God so that we know how to deal with the true reason of this season. Because sin is ever present, seeking to sift you and to steal your glory from God and to steal your victory. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 again and verse 15. Round noon, God speaking to this serpent, Satan, and he says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is why Jesus is here. Because of what happened in that garden way back then. Because we have separation from God. Jesus had to come to this earth. This is the first promise of the Messiah coming. Yes, we are celebrating Christmas right now. Jesus is ultimately the reason for the season. But Jesus comes because of the reason of what Adam done way back then. Way back then. Separation. But a God that loved us so much, 
Okay, way back then in Genesis 15, 3 and 15, he promises. He promises because he warns our fellowship saints. It is vitally important for you to fellowship. Find a reason to be in church. There's always going to be a reason not to be in fellowship. God loves our fellowship so much that thousands of years later, he keeps that promise of Genesis 3 and 15, that Jesus would come to fix the reason for the season, which is the separation we have from God. John 3 and 16, vow another, vow in one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have this everlasting life. Have this reconnection to God. He loved us so much, he sent his son to fix the reason for the season. The reason is that we don't have fellowship with God. Those of us that are saved, those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we understand the reason for the season. We are proof. We make God happy when we worship him, when we continue to live in the experience and the victory of the reason for the season. We're not meant to live in defeat. We're not meant to make the mistakes of Abram in Egypt and in Sarai and Abram with Hagar. We're not supposed to make these same mistakes. Any love and all our love. Eve is caught up in lust and love of this tree that she recognizes could be actually profitable to her. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Even the pride of life, she thought she can get smarter by poking with this tree. We must love God to the point that we're obedient. Let's get the double message in this here, saints. Our obedience is what pleases God. Abraham despises many mistakes. He gets to a place that the angel can say, now I know that no matter what comes, you won't hurl back nothing from me. Because the angel knew, and God knew, God knows what's most important to you. The most important thing in Abraham's life was Isaac, his only begotten son, whom he loveth. But he was willing to be obedient to God. Is it anything in your life that's coming before God? That's the reason for the season. The reason for the season is to take away anything that's getting in the way between you and your relationship with God. Let's be real and honest with ourselves today. It's a challenge. But I can assure you that no matter how many mistakes, no matter how many ease of experiences you have, no matter how many raw backup experiences you have, but if you take Deuteronomy 5 and say that I'm going to love God so much that I'm going to be obedient, God would enable you to have the victory over whatever's in your life. So that the angel of God, and God can say to you himself, now I know that thou lovest me more than anything and that you, I won't withhold nothing. I won't withhold my time. I won't withhold my treasure. I won't withhold my talent. I'll give it freely to God so that God can get the honor and the glory in my life. There's a challenge, saints. We are but flesh. We are even our nature. And we need to make sure that we love God more. Let me read my last three scriptures to you. First Corinthians chapter 15 and 22 says, For in Adam all are going to die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And this is the good news of Christmas. This is the good news of Christmas. Our right love, hallelujah, is what God has done to fix the separation of Adam's wrong love, that Adam's wrong love caused. That right love from God has fixed it. Adam's love was a genuine love, but it was a wrong love. I say to you, God provides the cure. Adam was the cause. God provides the cure in his son. Our sinful state is the reason for the season. The season shows what the right love looks like. The right love is what God has shown to us to bring us back into a place. We respond to that love by being obedient to God's word. 
not just love. Any type of love does not please God. This is where Obama gets it wrong. It's not anybody that has a love makes it right. You got to have the right love. And the right love is shown in this season because of the cost of what Adam done. We today celebrate this season recognizing that there is a God that loved us so much that it's fixed the separation in our lives. And he demands that we respond with obedience back to him. Yes, we see God's love, saints. Yes, we see what this love has done for us. God says we truly appreciate it and show our love to him but we just follow what he calls us to do. He's not going to call you to do exactly what he's called me to do. He deals with us individually. We all got our individual crosses to bear. We all got our own responsibilities, our own temptations, our own distractions, our own love for stuff that might get in the way of being obedient to God. But the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. Stay in his word. Stay in fellowship. And God will reveal to you what you need to do to get to that next level of your walk with him. This life as a Christian is a sacrificial life. It's not a life about what I want to do. It's about coming home and finding Eve's situation and saying, God, you still come first in my life. It's about coming home and realizing that you're asked to kill your only son. And you're willing to do it because you know that this is what God wants you to do. I don't know how that's going to look out and play out in your life. But I know that no matter what you face, if you take Abraham's stance in that month of Moriah, you will also be in a place where God can say, now nah, I know that you don't hold nothing back from me. Now nah, I know that it's nothing you wouldn't really do for me. And Abraham today is still receiving blessings for that. We learn in Luke 16 that the actual place for departed spirits gets controlled by Abraham up until Jesus' death and resurrection. All because this pagan guy that was weak in the first moments of being in Egypt made up his mind that I'm going to obey God rather than do what I want to do. Let us make sure that as we celebrate this season today, we understand really what the reason for this season is. It's our sinful state. It's our natural state that is away in separation from God. And that it is a God that's got a perfect love that he sent his son to bring us back into the proper place with God that we can be in. Every day, saints, you're going to be challenged, God first or God second. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To that, saints, that's what Abraham said when he was on that mountain. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this stuff I have for Isaac, all these plans I have for Isaac, will be added later on. And they were, saints. Okay? This is what God has laid on my heart today as we celebrate this festive season, as we remember that Jesus came and was born. It all came from a fact that we were in a sinful state and it was a God that loved us with a perfect love so much that he made up his mind that Jesus was going to come. Genesis 3 and 15 gets started because of this season. Because Adam had the wrong love. We are in this season today. Let's celebrate this right love God has demonstrated to us. Let's be motivated as children of God to truly show our true love to God by striving to individually be obedient to whatever God has called us to in this walk. I want to take this opportunity to reach out. Hallelujah. If you don't know and have not experienced the beauty, hallelujah, of salvation, the beauty of why this season is here, and knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if the Holy Spirit continues to compel you to come to Jesus, Please don't fight it. Please don't hold back. Repeat these words after me and experience Jesus for yourself. Hallelujah. God, I realize that I am a sinner. Lord, I realize that you love me 
so much that you gave me Jesus to die and to pay the price for my sins so that I can be forgiven. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I realize that he rose again so that I can rise this day and be free of sin. Thank you, God, for saving me. Hallelujah. If you've done that, hallelujah. Please reach out to hear from us and we can continue to be an inspiration to you as we help you to grow from strength to strength. Those of us that know God as our Lord and Savior, make sure that we love God more than we love anything else that's going on in our lives. Our time, our talent, our treasure belongs to God for us. And every day I preach it, every day I study it, I continue to challenge myself because Satan continues to put it in front of me. Stuff that my flesh would rather have in front. It's not an easy thing, but it's a beautiful, sweet victory when you make up your mind that Jesus is going to be first in your life. You get rewarded, rather here or in heaven, you're going to get rewarded. Stay faithful to God, saints, and be encouraged. This is what God has given me, and I pray that you're blessed and inspired on this wonderful day. Praise the Lord, saints.